Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce Government Affairs Forum for September. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome the 54th Mayor of the City of Boston, Martin J. Walsh, as our featured speaker this morning. Uh, as many of you know, the Chamber is committed to serving as the voice of the business community, especially during this period of a healthcare, economic, and racial crisis all occurring amidst an environmental reckoning in the form of climate change. We're in a moment that calls for strong, steady, and empathetic leadership in this tumultuous year, marked by partnership and collaboration, bringing people together and sectors together. And we're very, very proud that Mayor Walsh has provided all of that here in Boston. We're proud to serve alongside Mayor Walsh as he continues to lead and advocate for everybody in the city of Boston. Mayor Walsh is no stranger to this audience, especially during this pandemic. Uh, he has already updated the business community twice in sessions like this, uh, each one drawing over 800 people. And we welcome him back today for his annual address to the Chamber of Commerce of Greater Boston. Um, unfortunately, in this video format, I don't get the opportunity uh, that I would normally get um, when we are live uh, to recognize and thank all of the members of the mayor's cabinet uh, who I know are on uh, this, uh, this call today. Um, Catherine Burton, Chief of Staff, Police Commissioner Willie Gross, Superintendent of Schools, Fire Commissioner, all of the department heads. Uh, on behalf of the greater Boston business community, especially this year, we want to thank you for all of the work uh, that you're doing on behalf of the citizens and the business community of Boston during this difficult time. Before we get started, I want to give a huge thank you to our Government Affairs Forum sponsor, Bank of America, a longstanding partner of the Chamber of Commerce uh, in these Government Affairs Forum uh, series. Uh, Michal Chamberlain and his team here in Massachusetts uh, have done a fantastic job um, not only leading the bank, uh, being a leader here in Massachusetts, um, but also as you uh, look at uh, what the Bank of America has done in recent times, I hope that you got a chance to read yesterday's Boston Globe article about the way that Bank of America and Brian Moynihan uh, are stepping up and not just leading in Massachusetts, leading across the country uh, through financing sustainable uh, energy initiatives through financing economic development projects in communities of color. Uh, this is what leadership in this moment in the business community is all about. Uh, and I'm proud that the Chamber is partnering with Bank of America on this series and in so many other ways. A couple of housekeeping issues. Please note that today's webinar is being recorded and will be shared on the Chamber's YouTube page shortly after the presentation. Lastly, we invite you to submit your questions through the Q&A feature on your screen or by emailing chamber programs at bostonchamber.com. And with that, I'm proud to introduce our featured speaker, Boston Mayor Martin J. Walsh. Um, Mayor Walsh's time in office, uh, or during his time in office, he's focused on bringing Boston to the forefront of the global innovation economy elevating the local and national conversation on income inequality uh, and has been laser focused on housing development uh, for all. This year, as I said, we all know the mayor has been focused on leading the city's fight against the current COVID-19 pandemic and the ongoing racial crisis. Mayor Walsh most recently announced the creation of the Equity and Inclusion Cabinet led by Dr. Carolyn Crockett, the city's first ever chief of equity I'm sure some of you were able to tune into our recent conversation where we featured Mayor Walsh and Dr. Crockett as part of our Fierce Urgency of Now Festival. And that session alone was attended by over 400 young professionals of color here in Boston. So in this virtual format, um, the mayor has, uh, has uh, taken a different approach to today's session. He's prepared something special to take advantage of this digital platform. He'll speak to us via a video about what Boston has been through this year and how the city is moving forward. And then after the speech, we'll be joined live by Mayor Walsh for audience Q&A. So let's take a look 
uh, at the mayor's video remarks, and then we'll come back for some conversation. Good morning to all the leaders, members, and guests of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. I'm addressing you this year under very different circumstances, so I'm here at a different place than our usual venue. It's a place that tells the story of our city, what we've been going through this year, and how we've responded, and how we must move forward together. This is the Guild in Dorchester. It's a refuge created by black and brown Bostonians where neighbors come together to heal, reclaim, and revitalize their community. When COVID hit, the Guild jumped into action. They transformed this sanctuary into a relief hub, providing food, supplies, comfort, and care to the families and seniors in their community. But the need was overwhelming, and their staff and volunteers themselves at high risk from COVID. It was the same story at so many of our nonprofits. At the same time, members of Boston's business community were reaching out to me every day asking, what can I do to help? That's why, in March, we created the Boston Resiliency Fund to connect these powerful forces of compassion in our city and put them to work saving lives. Boston responded in a big way. We blew past our fundraising goals, and in a matter of days, we were getting food, health care, diapers, and formula into the homes of our residents through trusted community providers. With the Resiliency Fund backing, the Guild expanded its reach from a few hundred neighbors to a total of now over 30,000 residents, including seniors, families in quarantine, and immigrant households in neighborhoods all across the city. One young woman discovered a passion for volunteering at the Guild and connecting her with elderly neighbors. She said, it's so much more than just distributing supplies, it's uplifting our community. In tough times, Bostonians work together. No one should get left behind. That's what the Guild works for here. And that's what we work for in every neighborhood of our city, so Boston could stay home and flatten the curve. To date, the Resiliency Fund has raised over $33 million from 6,700 individual, people, companies, and foundations. We have distributed over $26 million to 348 organizations that are feeding, clothing, and caring for the vulnerable of our city. 55% of those organizations are led by persons of color, 58% are led by women, and 27% are immigrant-serving organizations. That's who our city is. I want to thank everyone who donated to the Resiliency Fund for your generosity and for the many businesses who reached out in our time of need. And I want to thank the volunteers and workers who deliver these services to their neighbors and to continue to do so every single day. We proved in Boston there's absolutely nothing we can't do when we come together. Early on in the crisis, I made decisions sooner than some were comfortable with to close school buildings, cancel events, and pause construction. I know why there was hesitancy. What the scientists were telling us was frightening. But we had to listen to that science and we had to take action. Lives were at stake. And I knew our city would rise to the occasion. Here's what we did. We brought in the McChrystal Group to help us reorganize the operations of the city government around the daily crisis response. We created a daily text message alert system that gets critical information to nearly 100,000 residents in 11 different languages. We brought COVID testing to 18 community health centers, making sure that every single resident has access to no-cost testing from a trusted provider in their own neighborhood. We built Boston Hope Medical Center at the Convention Center in five days providing care for 750 COVID patients and protecting our hospital capacity. We created a health inequities task force and an immigrant collaborative to target resources to the vulnerable communities that are hardest hit by COVID. We put together a citywide food access system that has distributed over 3.5 million free meals to families and seniors in need. We funded 1,000 childcare seats for essential workers. In addition to gearing up our first responders, We've sent 700,000 units of PPE to outside partners, including nursing homes, community health centers, domestic violence shelters, and homeless providers. We bought 40,000 laptops for our students learning at home. We got 850 permanent rental vouchers into the hands of families with the students in the Boston Public Schools who are at the risk from homelessness. We doubled our shelter capacity and placed 250 formerly homeless individuals into permanent housing. 
and we created a rental relief fund that got $3 million to nearly 900 households who couldn't otherwise pay their rent. We created a small business fund and have gotten $9 million to over 2,500 businesses. More than half of them are owned by people of color. We've approved over 550 restaurants all across the city for outdoor dining, both in public and private spaces. And in COVID-related city contracting, 33% of our spending has gone to certified women and minority-owned businesses. To get all this done, we worked more collaboratively than ever before. Seven straight months of crisis response has made city government more integrated, more nimble, more responsive. And we're going to stay that way. We have broken down silos, and we're working with anyone who can help our city move forward. Health centers and nonprofits, businesses and community groups, colleges and universities. And we're going to keep working together every single day to get our city through this pandemic and meet all the challenges that lie ahead. Let me give you an update on where we stand. As of September 25th, Boston has recorded 16,924 cases of COVID-19. 13,852 of those patients have made confirmed recoveries. 762 Bostonians have lost their lives, and let's not forget them. As of now, roughly 1,800 Bostonians are being tested for COVID every day, and our current positive rate is 2.7%. All but four neighborhoods are under 4% positivity, with East Boston around 6%, Dorchester around 5%, and High Park and Rosendale around 4%. Black Bostonians represent 32% of all our total cases, while making up 22% of our population. And Latinx Bostonians are 31% of our cases, compared to 20% of our population. These and other data are the metrics we monitor every single day. What they tell us now is that we have come a very long way since the peak of our surge in late April. But they also tell us that the virus is still very much with us. And the inequalities affecting communities of color and immigrant communities continue to define the impacts of this pandemic, the health impacts, and the economic impacts as well. Limiting the spread and preventing another surge depends on the actions that we all take. To avoid transmitting the virus, to work together as a city in our response, and to bring resources and support to those who are most severely impacted. We are still in the thick of this fight. COVID is still very much with us. Economic recovery will be a long, hard road. Racial injustice must be addressed, and equity must be our shared goal. These are no small tasks. Based on our response so far, we have proven we can do hard things. And my priorities remain clear. I am dedicated to keeping the residents of our city safe throughout this pandemic, supporting them through whatever hardships they face, addressing the inequities that hold us back, and rebuilding our economy in a way that works for everyone. And I'm committed to pushing forward a plan for the future, because just as we are meeting the needs of the pandemic, we must adapt to meet the economic, social, and global challenges of tomorrow. Today, I'm going to talk about how we're advancing these priorities in city government and what we must all do to stay safe, recover, and rebuild our city. I'll start with our city finances. Every organization has faced tough realities this year. Whether you're a local business or a large corporation, a neighborhood nonprofit, or a world's world famous hospital, you have to tighten your belt and make tough decisions. City government is no exception. This year, we put in place a hiring freeze on non-essential positions, and we cut $65 million from the budget for fiscal year 2021. Despite this loss in revenue, we made sure to protect our record new investments in education, in affordable housing, and in public health, because these are the fundamental needs are more important now than ever. And we protected city workers. We have more than 18,000 City of Boston employees, and not one has missed the paycheck. They've been able to continue spending and supporting grocery stores, restaurants, and small businesses all across our city. We also maintained our capital investments so that we can continue to strengthen our city, and Boston remains a place where people want to raise their families and come to work. In the midst of a trying time, residents in every neighborhood will continue to see improvements in safety, opportunity, and quality of life in their communities. For example, Last week, we topped off Engine 42 in Roxbury, 
the first new firehouse in Boston in over three decades. On Saturday, we started work on our newest bus lanes, the outbound route down Washington Street in Rosendale. And next month, we will open the $17 million, 27,000 square foot renovation of the Roxbury branch of the Boston Public Library in Nubian Square. It's the largest neighborhood branch in the system and it's a transformative library that Roxbury deserves with public art, learning spaces, and 21st century resources. It will host an African-American collection and a center for economic justice dedicated to Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King's legacy in our city. We've been laying the groundwork to withstand a crisis like this for years. Through responsible budgeting, we earned a perfect AAA bond rating for a record seven years in a row. That put us in a position to weather this storm while continuing to support our city and invest in our neighborhoods. An analysis reported in the New York Times last month found that Boston is the city government best prepared fiscally for the current economic crisis. We will continue to make whatever adjustments to our budgets are needed because protecting the city's financial health is how we maintain a well-functioning government that can be there for people in both good times and in hard times. On so many issues, the priorities, the planning, and the investments we made before COVID have put us in a stronger position to respond, recover, and rebuild. In housing, on top of the thousand new rental vouchers for BPS families, we are creating the first city-funded voucher program in Boston's history. And we continue our two-year legislative push for right to legal counsel for tenants and eviction proceedings. That's more crucial than ever, as the state and the federal eviction moratorium expires. In transportation, the plans we made to expand bus lanes and bike lanes are exactly what we need to help frontline workers to get to and from their jobs safely. Now we're making them permanent. On the environment, the pandemic has shown us why our commitment to following science, investing in resilience, and advancing environmental justice is so important. I've expanded investment in parks all across the city, and I've kept the pledge I made at the Chamber two years ago to invest 10% of our capital budget in waterfront parks that protect our homes and businesses. Because we created the nation's first municipal office of recovery services, we've been able to help those who need help the most with addiction throughout this pandemic as we fight in court for our long-term regional recovery campus on Long Island. And in education, the three-year, $100 million investment that I announced at the beginning of this year is targeted directly at equity and opportunity gaps that impact students with the deepest needs. And now it's helping us support our students most in need during this pandemic. Last week, the Boston Public Schools opened remotely for the first time in history. To be ready, we accelerated our plans to make Boston a district that provides a computer for every single student. As we do this work, we're preparing for the education model that emerges when we move past this pandemic. To close the digital divide over the long term, we're going to need all hands on deck. We're going to need every single level of government, along with the private sector, to step up in a big way to find and fund solutions. It's not just an achievement gap in our schools, it's a skills gap in our future workforce. And it's the concept of equity clearly defined. A child without a computer or internet at home needs a different level of engagement and investment than a child in a well-resourced home. Especially when you consider how likely it is that the same child also experiences systemic racism through housing insecurities, health inequities, and a host of other challenges. We have to address these issues together. That's why we are committed to rebuilding an economy that works for everyone. We are working with leaders and experts in every industry, providing safety guidelines and protective equipment, listening to their needs and concerns, and identifying opportunities to help, especially the hardest hit. To help the tourism sector rebuild, we have launched a plan for marketing campaign to invite and welcome regional visitors to our city in a safe and healthy way. We are making sure Boston is open for business and investments is coming to our city. In the last two months, we have approved 776,000 square feet of development, 421 units of housing, 30% of which are income restricted affordable homes. That's not counting Suffolk Downs, 
the largest private investment in affordable housing and resilient infrastructure in Boston's history. As we welcome major investments, we're also in the trenches, helping our small businesses. They are the backbone of our neighborhood economies and local communities, and they have taken a huge hit due to COVID. So while we've taken the steps necessary to protect our residents, we've also worked harder than ever before to understand and respond to the needs of our small businesses. For restaurants like El Barrio Cafe in Dorchester, these measures have been lifesavers. Owner Joandre Vasquez said he could not have reopened without the grant funding and outdoor dining supports from the city. That's also why I'm here at the Guild today. This is a place where black and brown Bostonians come together to share ideas and grow new businesses. At a time when we're planning our economic recovery, we must continue to foster creativity, encourage innovation, and remove barriers for communities of color to build wealth. Racial equity is not a new conversation. In 2016, I devoted my chamber address to calling out our city to dismantle and end systemic racism. Here's what I said. Racial inequities are evident in health, education, and almost every aspect of community and individual well-being. These disparities are not only rooted in history, they continue to be presenting barriers to opportunity today. That means it's not enough to have colorblind policies. It's not enough to have good intentions. Personal virtues don't add up to systemic change. It was the first time in Boston's history that a mayor put ending systemic racism at the top of our city's agenda. And we've advanced this priority in every aspect of city policy, in our school investments, in our housing policies, in our neighborhood investments, in transportation access. It's our economic vision, and that's our public health mission. The COVID crisis is a good example. It's a lesson in systemic inequality and has taken intentional work every day to address it. That's also a lesson on how we are leading in Boston by tackling inequities head on and unlocking the immense talent in the black community and communities of color to build, create and succeed. But when George Floyd was murdered in late May of this year, it was clear we are nowhere near ending systemic racism and achieving justice in our country. The conversation in the 70s, 80s, or 90s didn't get us there. The conversations after Ferguson didn't get us there. The conversations we had with the Chamber in 2016 didn't get us there. This time must be different. In the coming days, I will receive the final recommendations of our Police Reform Task Force. We will break new ground in accountability, diversity, and transparency. But ending systemic racism goes so much further than police policies. As I said in 2016, it affects every aspect of our society and every kind of opportunity. That's what systemic means. And that's why we're reorganized city government, putting a chief of equity in my cabinet to drive this work forward and make sure everything we do is laser focused on ending systemic racism and achieving our racial equity in our city. I don't want to be back here in this chamber meeting three years from now, having the same conversation again. We must do more, all of us, the city of Boston, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, all of our 351 cities and towns, and every leader in the private sector. We also need leadership at the head of our federal government. Boston, in every city and state, needs a steady partner in Washington and a White House committed to the health and well-being of all Americans. Unfortunately, we don't have that, and our country has paid the price. But in the meantime, Boston will lead on COVID, on economic recovery, on racial justice, on climate action. These are tough fights, and we face a long road ahead. We need to keep making health and safety our priority every day. We need to work together to rebuild our economy so it works for everyone. And we need to guarantee justice for everyone who calls our city and our country home. At this moment of uncertainty, we must continue to move Boston forward. As mayor, I'm focused on our safety, our recovery, and our path ahead. And while our city battles a pandemic, I've drawn on strengths, the resilience, and the selflessness I've seen and felt all across the city. If you are on this call or watching this speech, I want to thank you. I want to thank the businesses and nonprofit leaders who reached out to help us. I want to thank the nurses and doctors and medical staff 
who worked around the clock to save lives. I want to thank the police, fire, and EMS first responders who never stopped being there for us, no matter the risk. I want to thank the grocery store workers, the restaurant workers, and delivery drivers who kept us fed. I want to thank all of our public employees who've kept our city government going without missing a beat. I want to thank everyone who works from home and continues to work from home. I want to thank the parents and guardians who are helping children learn at home while trying to do their own jobs and manage their finances. I want to thank the small business owners who have worked so hard. I want to thank every single person who puts on a mask when they leave the house. Boston has been knocked down before, but we've always gotten back up. And when we rise up, we reach back and lift all those who have been held down in the past. This year, and these challenges are no different. We are determined to keep the people of our city safe. We are determined to come out of this crisis a more resilient and a more equitable city than we entered it. We are Boston, and there is nothing we can't do when we work together. Thank you. God bless you. God bless the city of Boston. Well, thank you, Mayor Walsh, for um, that inspiring and, and quite interesting um, uh, speech and, and conversation. Uh, I do want to um, uh, give a uh, special shout out to someone I should have at the beginning, uh, your Chief of Public Health, Marty Martinez, who has just been a rock um, during, uh, during this COVID crisis. So. Uh, Chief Martinez, thank you on behalf of the business community. I also want to remind our audience to use the Q&A feature to send in some questions. Um, and with that, um, Maya, um, I always appreciate the way you use these speeches. You, you mentioned um, uh, calling uh, out the business community and bringing attention to economic inequality and racism in Boston a few years ago. You used a speech <laughs> to highlight uh, the environmental crisis and climate change a couple of years ago. Today, uh, you chose to bring the business community to the Guild and show us uh, the neighborhoods uh, using this video platform in a different way. Tell us about that decision and the choice of the Guild. And I do, by the way, uh, for those interested, the uh, website of the Guild is theguild.works if you want to learn more about it. But Maya, tell us about the sort of decision to use this platform in the way you just did. Yeah, th thank you, Jimmy. Let me just uh, thank you, Jimmy, and the chamber for uh, for continuing this tradition and this this lunch today. Uh, it's really important that the business community. It's kind of uh, my opportunity to address to the business community um, where we are in Boston, where we're going in Boston, and, and the importance of, of not just investments, but of the business community being a participant and a partner in all of our work. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, we chose the guild because it, it, it's it. It shows the power of, of, quite honestly, of our black and brown community uh, meeting the challenges uh, of equity during a very different, difficult time. Uh, it opened up, it's in the Carbon Square area, between Carbon Square and Four Corners, so uh, of, of Washington Street. Um, I was up there a couple of years ago when they opened it. And it started out as kind of a therapeutic community, yoga and, and meditation, a lot of different things. And, and quite honestly, it's transformed into a lifesaver for the community during uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, there's a food pantry there. Uh, there, there. There's all kinds of different programming for the community. The day I was there, there was probably about 100 people inside and outside waiting to, to get food and to get different services. And um, the Guild, quite honestly, is it, just, um, it's, it's a great resource for the city of Boston. And it's a great, it's a great uh, operation in the city. And, and the Resiliency Fund um, helped, helped be able to provide food. I mean. I don't think they ever dreamed in their wildest imagination that they would serve over 30,000 families food and other services during the pandemic. And if you think about it, if the Guild wasn't in its location, um, the, the, the people that, that got services there wouldn't be able to access service in a lot of parts of the city. So I'd ask people to check it out. Um, and, and if you have an opportunity, that they, they definitely need support. Um, inside was renovated last year when I, when I did the tour, they were going to do it. I think a $2.5 million renovation. They're trying to raise funds for it. And the community rallied around it. They paid $100,000 and, and they got a beautiful renovation because of donated labor and, and everything else. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible resource uh, in our city. Most people on this call, um, don't, they, you don't need the guild. You don't have to go there for food. You don't have to go there for services. Uh, but there's so many Bostonians in our city that, that, that need uh, places like the guild. And so the support to that, that organization would be incredible. Well, thank you for doing that. And, um, you know, uh, to the people on this 
on this call, you know, find a way to, to support organizations like the Guild and follow the lead of businesses like Bank of America who are out there doing so much in, in not only Boston's but other neighborhoods. So um, I hope that'll be one of the outcomes of this meeting that we, we all decide to just step that game up um, and do, I know the business community is doing incredible things today, but um, now's a special time of need. Um, I do want to shift to um, uh, some of the conversation you had about, um, you know, a view I share, which is the past efforts around issues of, of uh, racial inequality, income inequality, just haven't gotten the job done. I mean, you know, we've said, uh, we've said something uh, similar. Uh, and as you took a, a, a look at that, one of your tactics was to create this new position, this chief of equity in your cabinet, uh, and name uh, uh, Dr. Callan Crockett to the position. Uh, a very exciting choice, and I would, I would encourage people on the uh, on the call to get to know Callan and and be prepared to be impressed. But um, you mentioned that stage one was kind of an assessment of city hall and city government. Um, so having going through that process, what are you and Callan seeing, uh, and what 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 will be some of the priorities of of uh, Dr. Crockett's office? I think first and foremost, the priorities of Dr. Crockett's office is to make sure that the, the work that we embark on, the work that we start on continues through, uh, and, and that it's not just uh, in a silo, that it's throughout the city of Boston, throughout different different cabinet positions and different, different departments. Uh, one example is when we declared racism a public health crisis in the city of Boston, uh, a lot of people feel that that is just dealing with health inequities and it, it's going to be public work, public health. But in fact, it touches housing, it touches policing, it touches education, it touches job creation, it touches the wealth gap, it touches so many different places. And what Carol Carolyn's been doing is really been meeting with internal stakeholders as well as external stakeholders to work on how do we not just create policy, but how do we implement uh, this change in policies throughout the city of Boston. Over the last seven years, we've done a lot of work, as I mentioned in the speech, uh, around uh, inequities, whether it's been in housing, uh, and not having lack of housing and increasing the ability for affordability, but also thinking about how do we create um, you know, more ability to buy first time home buyers. And we did the, the one plus mortgage program. Um, and, and what Carolyn really is doing is, is in the cabinet, uh, collaboration in a cabinet is so important. When, when, when I see our cabinet come together, and unfortunately we've been in Zooms now for seven months, but we all feed off each other and learn off each other. And understanding that equity has to be the top priority for every cabinet position, whether that's a superintendent of the Boston Public Schools, or excuse me, the commissioner of the Boston Public Schools, superintendent of Boston Public Schools, or arts and culture. Uh, that's really what, what Carolyn is working on, that class co cross collaboration. Um, you know, whether, when the police reform task force is about to come out with recommendations, uh, we're gonna be looking at those as multi layers. There's about five major recommendations there. Uh, some of it can be implemented uh, quickly. Some of it um, needs to be uh, law changes, a little bit of collective bargaining, but it's also how do we make sure this work gets carried out? Carolyn's cabinet will be part of that. When you think about Marty Martinez and, and, and declaring racism a public health crisis, Carolyn's office is going to be working on that, working on housing policies, working on a whole bunch of different policies across, across the spectrum here in the city. Um, you know, she, uh, I know she's on the call and she gets embarrassed when I say this, and you know this, uh, she's an amazing person, uh, has an incredible background. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, it's important for us and, and a lot of pressure on Carolyn and myself and our administration that this, the groundwork gets laid and it gets done properly so that whoever follows um, Carolyn or, and, and these, as we move forward here in the city, the important work is the groundwork that's done right now. So, um, Mayor, um, law enforcement, I'd like to get your thoughts on this. Um, the the practice of law enforcement in our communities, in particular communities of color, um, is being challenged um, here in Boston, across the state, indeed across the country. Uh, you alluded to um, uh, the reform package that is uh, being developed. Um, yeah, give us, a, give us a, some insight into the, your, your views on the broader topic of law enforcement in communities of color and what types of reforms um, you see is necessary in this moment? You know, I, I think what we're seeing here, uh, a, a lot of this kind of resurgence of um, people protesting and letting their voices be heard happened after George Floyd was killed. 
um, the issue of community policing and the issue of um, some of the tactics police officers use around the country have been at the forefront of this conversation for a long time. Uh, I, I want to be able to say we can separate Boston from what, what happened in Minneapolis and other places that doesn't happen here, but that's not good enough. People, people are asking for, for accountability. Uh, and what we did was we put together a task force uh, of, of community members, community uh, lawyers, and, and, and folk, folks in the community to talk about what they see, what they see, how they, we, we improve policing. We've done this one other time. We've, we've done it after Ferguson when President Obama uh, was the president. Uh, he brought cities from around America to the White House. Uh, we were one of them. And, and he did something called 21st Century Policing where they came up with a, a blueprint on what policing should look like in America. Some cities implemented some of those changes and some cities did. We in Boston did implement some of the changes in that. In that. And we're seeing benefits from that. Uh, but when, when you see the events of, of Minneapolis and, and, and Atlanta and, and other places around the country, there's so much more work to be done. So there's two, two ways of attacking it. One is running away from it or, running, or one's running towards it. And what we're doing here in Boston is running towards it. And we're sitting down with our, our police commissioner and, and his team uh, and we're working on what policies and how can we change so that we can make sure that we have the best trained, best, best, trained, uh, best police department in the country. I'd say we do today. Uh, but what we're looking at is there's four or five aspects. One is looking at the use of force and use of policy. And, and there's some recommendations that's going to be coming down uh, to talk about that. There's going to be a second policy about, about really making sure we think about diversity hiring in our police department, not just at the, the police officer level, but the entire, throughout the entire administration. And that's one of the, one of the, um, one of the, the places that Carolyn's office is working as well on. Uh, we're also going to be making sure about transparency and putting all, a lot of this information in real-time data up on the screen uh, and making sure that, that, that people can see and track where, where complaints against police officers are. And, and one of them is a civilian review board, or, or, or we're looking at what the model is going to be here. Um, that's something that a lot of cities and towns across America have been afraid, afraid of for years. Uh, and really, there's no reason to be afraid of it. I mean, it, what it does, it really allows people the opportunity to take a look at to see some of these infractions against police officers, to, to vet it through a process, and be able to look at how do we move forward. And, and the, I think the fifth one's body cameras. Uh, we have body cameras on our offices now, but we, we're looking to get universally across more body cameras out there. So I think what it does, it, it's one step towards building trust. But at the end of the day, um, it's our police officers in the street building relationships and trust with the community, and particularly the, the African-American community in the city of Boston, the communities of color. That, that ultimately is, is the goal. I mean, you can put technology on people, we can put all these reforms in place, which are gonna help us through transparency, but it really still is gonna come down to that basic connection. And, and I have to say this, Boston Police Department have done a really good job uh, in, in, this, in this time, as far as continuing to build relationships up, and they're gonna continue to build relationships up. It doesn't mean that we're not gonna have one-offs here and there, we're gonna have issues that we have to deal with, but, but I think it's about transparency and relationships that we have to continue to work on. Mayor, you, you, it sounds like you may have answered this follow-up question in part, but you know, those of us on this call that watch the national news see the difference in Portland, Seattle, Minneapolis, and, and sort of experience here in Boston. And all, although early on, as you said, you know, we did have um, some vandalism that occurred, but by and large, the protests have been peaceful. And as I've been thinking about what's the difference, I know that you know, our president is fond of saying they're all Democratic-led cities, but last time I checked, you were a Democrat. Um, and, you know, so, you know, the, the what's the difference question pops up. And I think at least in my view, it, it comes down to something you said, which is this willingness to establish partnerships and relationships and being able to call on people um, in the community, whether it's uh, the clergy or other stakeholders. Uh, and have a conversation about how we're going to deal with this together. I'm just yeah. wondering, you know, is that is that the, the the key ingredient, or what's your perspective on why different cities are experiencing this differently? I think that's part of it. I also think that the people that, that are, are demonstrating and walking around the city of Boston uh, are, are keeping the issue that that the systemic racism conversation at the forefront of their marches and, and their walks. And, and I think that you know that people have been able to understand that you know people want to send a very clear message to, to to elected officials and to society that we have to continue to address systemic racism and i think a lot of the protesters that we've had out there 
uh, have basically, maybe policing is the wrong word, but have kind of kept an eye on, on a lot of these marches to say like, you know, the reason why we're here is because of whether it's uh, a loss of life of George Floyd or a loss of life of Breonna Taylor or, or social injustices, it goes well, well beyond or far beyond policing. It goes into a lot of our policies and, and racist policies, quite honestly, that have been, that have been in place for generations here in, in, in the country. Uh, and, and breaking down those systemic problems that that's something we have to do. So I think that, you know, it, it's been the relationships that we have as far as police have with a lot of the folks that are out on the street marching, but it really is the groups marching. I mean, you, you know, when you have a march, I mean, we, people need to listen. And, 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 you know, the very first press conference we had after George Floyd, I, I made a comment that, you know, I'm, I, I have, we white people have to sit back and listen we have to listen and hear what people are saying this time. Uh, and I got a little criticism saying it was time for action. I wasn't, you know, easy to quickly throw that out there. It is time for action, but it's also a time to understand that why are so many people, particularly African-American people, why are so many people so upset with the lack of progress in our country to this point? And, and, it, and it, it was a time to listen and it is a time to listen and it is a time for action. And the action can't just be, which policy is important, but it has to be deeper than policy. To, to take you back to Carolyn's office, you know, Carolyn's office isn't about producing policy and, and, and passing policy. Carolyn's office is about taking action and action off of the policy, action off of legislation, action off of what people want to see. And, and, and now in this country, in 2016, when I gave that speech at the chamber, you know, we felt, I felt, we, we had a conversation in, in my office where I am right now. We talked about, you know, we want to be a little different in these speeches, not just announcing, you know, bold plans. And we, you know, one of the things that we recognized and we realized that before, I, quite honestly, during the mass campaign 2013, systemic racism is an, is an issue in America. So I made it a focal point of the speech. Two thirds of the speech in 2016 was about it. And, and when you think about the time from 2016 to now, um, yeah, there's been some advancements, but clearly not enough. It, and it goes deeper than Boston. It's, it's around the country, but I can't focus. I can't change what's happening in America right now. But what we can do is work on this, what's happening in Boston right now. I have a follow-up from the audience on this subject matter, and then I'll move to another subject, but I'm specifically addressing uh, the wealth gap um, uh, in Boston and, and beyond. Um, uh, but I know this is a subject you and I have talked about uh, quite extensively, but um, what's in the what's in the toolkit, uh, a toolbox to deal with the uh, deal with the wealth gap? In uh, in 2014, uh, we we had a, a, an office in City Hall called the Women's Commission, um, and we changed the, not only the name but the the format and, and the mission of that office to Women's Advancement. Uh, and in that in that in the very early days of that office, we sat with the business community and and, and Jim Yu and and talked about getting data to look at uh, the gap uh, between women and men, uh, and then the gap between white women, African-American women, Latino women, and the pay equity gap there. And this information has allowed us to be able to really uh, create some, some, some metrics and some policy that we're addressing the wage gap. And many companies are very cognizant of that now of making sure that when they're thinking whether it's a, a pay equity for a woman doing the same job as a man or even leadership uh, in, on our boards and commissions in our com companies. And there's been a lot of great progress work there. We're not done yet, we still have more work to do. And, and I think that we actually have to look at doing something very similar. You and I talked about it last night uh, and looking at families of color. When you, when you see the wealth of a, of a black family at $8, uh, wealth, um, generated wealth and a white family, $272, I explained that wrong. Uh, that's a problem and we've talked about it now and we've tried to inc incorporate some policies. And, and one of the asks to, to the chamber today is to businesses is that we need that information, we need that data. We need you to be a partner in this. We really have to be cognizant. We have to build wealth. We have to build wealth for, for black Americans. We have to build wealth for Latino Americans. We have to build wealth because what's happening is people aren't able to um, you know, stay afloat. They're not able to pay their rent. They're certainly not able to buy a home. Uh, they're being forced into poverty. And, and that is not how we continue to battle systemic racism. I know many banks have worked on and companies have worked on policies on, on, on first time home buyer programs and lending money, but we need to go so much deeper and so much more into that. Because when you think about that wealth gap, that, that is a serious problem. And some of it's intergenerational poverty. And generally what you want to see is families, as families 
you know, the next generation comes, you want to see them be in a little better position than the previous. Uh, that's not happening, unfortunately, in, in our black community here in Boston or in this country. Uh, maybe certain pockets of the country it's happening, but not, not, to, not, to, the, not to the magnitude it needs to happen here. Well, thank you for that answer, Mayor. And I know that many times, like I just did, um, we ask elected officials like yourself, what are you going to do about it? Uh, when some of the responsibility lies with the business community and we accept that responsibility in our partnership with you on uh, things like contracting with uh, with black and brown businesses, uh, both in the private and the public sector. So look forward to continuing to work with you on that. Um, let's shift to opening of schools. Um, uh, child care and schools is a big issue for uh, reopening in the business community. I know it's a big issue for education in and of itself, uh, but the ability of people to return to work and, and focus on on their jobs is, um, uh, that's one of the key factors. So uh, how has the reopening gone and, and what can we look forward to? Well, we, we have, uh, we've reopened uh, remotely uh, last week. Um, and from all what I'm hearing back from parents, most parents are saying that the, the, the online learning is, is much, much more, um, much better right now than it was last year. Um, you know, Boston and any urban district, we're not an online uh, educational platform. Uh, we're in person, and then last year we had to shut schools down. Uh, we clearly had to go remote, and and you know we had to figure out how do we get this up and running in a matter of literally about a week and a half. I think we did. Um, over the summer, we we're able to work with our teachers and our administrators and our leaders, and and come up with a, with a system that's a lot stronger. Um, starting uh, this Thursday, our intention is to open uh, schools for, in a hybrid model for um, our highest need students. Um, we're going into it's called A and B cohorts. Uh, so on uh, Thursday and Friday, there'll be a group of students in. Then Monday and Tuesday, the following week, there'll be a different group of students in. Um, and these are special need and high, high risk students. Within two weeks, uh, it'll be four days a week for these kids. Um, we um, don't have the exact numbers of who's coming back to school. All of our, our in-person learning from now through at least December, January is all opt-in by parents. Uh, many, some parents have decided to opt in, some parents decided to opt out, some parents have, since we've done it, want to change and we're working on it. So uh, on Thursday will be the first time we actually have students in the building learning. Um, I think that, you know, in the very beginning of this, it's going to be uh, a little complicated because uh, we've never done anything like this before. We, we only have a little bit of roadmap from what other districts have done, uh, and they've only done it for a short period of time. Uh, we've made major investments in our schools to get them up to speed. We've We've put in cleaning supplies. We've had open windows in every classroom. We've put in fans for, for circulation of air. We have PPE uh, for masks. We have nurses' rooms. We have uh, kind of uh, confinement rooms for, for students that might be sick. Uh, we're limiting the amount of people that can go into a school building right now uh, for access. Uh, we're working with our teachers. We're working with our custodians. We're working with our lunch monitors. We're working with our bus drivers. So. Um, we, we will, as we move forward here, it's, it's, it's not, a, not, an easy, uh, not an easy process that we've gone through here, but um, again, um, I think it's so important when I think about opportunity and achievement gaps uh, in our city, particularly for our black and brown kids, uh, those numbers continue to grow every year. That's kind of the, the focal point. And, uh, many of the kids that go into school um, on Thursday, tomorrow, uh, they, will been, they will have been out of a school building for nearly seven months. It'll be their first time physically in a school. Uh, it is, it, you know, it's so important, I think, that we, we get to a sense where we can get, if ch parents want to send their kids back to school, they get back in. There's nothing like in-person learning. And I think it's so important that we continue to, 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 to work on this and master this. And uh, there'll, there'll, be, there'll be bumps along the way. There's no question about it. We have a, a phased in approach. So we did it in phases, phase one. Phase, phase one was, the, was the, um, the beginning of school. Phase two starts tomorrow. Then we have phase three, which is going to be uh, K0 to K2 in a couple of weeks, uh, one to three, four to eight, and then high schoolers. So we have these phases built out. We're, we're monitoring the, the COVID numbers very closely. Uh, even since I, 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 caught, I did the speech the other day, I think I, I, I did it on Saturday, and the numbers from Saturday to Tuesday have already changed. Our, our citywide rate on Saturday was 2.8%. Our citywide rate today is 2%. So it, the, these numbers changed drastically every 
every couple of days. Um, when, I, when I spoke about Rosendale was 4% on Saturday, it's under 4% today. So uh, we're watching data and we're, we're talking to science. We're watching science and talk, looking at data and talking experts. We wanna make sure that if, if, we, if we move forward at any phase, um, if we're moving forward, that means that we feel confident that we're going to keep our teachers and our students and our, and our, and our folks safe. If for any reason we decide to put a pause on anything, uh, we feel that, that that's what the science is telling us, that we have to be cautious. Um, Mayor, another key um, uh, issue as it relates to reopening is the, um, is the feeling of confidence and safety riding public transportation. Recently, um, at a T board meeting, they discussed given some uh, budget issues, uh, that they may have to consider service cuts and fare increases down the road. Um, you know Boston is a very transit-oriented and in some cases transit-dependent cities. I know you, you don't run it, um, but, um, but your views on public transportation, not only getting through this crisis, but for the continued economic growth of the, of the city. Yeah, I think that uh, when you think about, I'll come back to, I'll come back to, the, the, the T is a microcosm of what's happening in society today as far as budgets. And I'll come back to that in a second. But, but I think that, you know, the ridership of the T has been very low as of right now. Um, and, and I think part of it is due to many businesses have not come back to work. Part of it might be due to lack of confidence in taking the T. And I think that uh, in fairness to the general manager, they've done a very good job of trying to express to people how, how they've put precautions in place to keep the T clean and that people can return back to the MBTA and have confidence in the system as far as understanding it right now that it's, it, could be, it can be safe to ride the T, and that's an issue. The issue of budgets, um, you know, the MBTA, I mentioned it, we had to cut $65 million out of this year's budget. Um, we have the, the state government that hasn't passed the budget yet. They're talking about potentially, I think, November passing a state budget. They've done 112 budgets. Um, they, they have a, a revenue problem. We are going to have a revenue problem in the city of Boston. Many businesses on this call have a revenue problem. And really what we have to do is we have to, as a government, as a government entity, I think the federal government really needs to continue to step up here and put together that, that second cares package so that we're not losing businesses across the country. And quite honestly, we're not losing cities and states across the country. You know, Boston fiscally right now, we're in a, we're in a pretty good position as far as coming, going through COVID. That doesn't mean that in, in next year's budget, the year after, the year after, we don't know how, what, how, how that economic outlook looks because of loss of revenue, whether it's in meals tax or property tax or whatever tax it might be. So I think that, you know, it, it, the federal government needs to really have a major focus on how do we bail out um, municipalities around the country and bail out states around the country. Because if they don't, um, Massachusetts and Boston, we have to have a balanced budget. Uh, we can't we can't deficit spend like the federal government does every day, um, and, and if, meaning that if we can't pay the bills, we have to make deep cuts. And I'm proud that we're able to. Not every city in Massachusetts was able to keep their workforce working. Many of them did layoffs. Some of them did furloughs. Uh, we didn't have to do that in Boston. But that doesn't mean that if we don't, if the federal government doesn't start paying attention to cities and towns across America, the MBTA. Uh, and, and entities like the MBTA, they're going to be forced to either raise taxes or raise revenue. And, and this isn't about paying debt down. This is about staying open. And, and there's a big difference in having a conversation today about fare increase in the MBTA and what they were, say, eight months ago. Eight months ago, people kind of were upset about it because it was about paying debt down. And people felt that they, they, we needed to make investments in the MBTA to get it to you know, 21st century transportation. We still need those investments in the MBTA. But today, it's about keeping their door open. They've had six months of loss of customers, loss of revenue, loss of ridership. Uh, that loss of, I'm assuming, advertising, that's going to have a big impact. And, you know, and, and the state can't just write a check to, to bail anyone out. The federal government needs to step in here in a big way. Uh, Mayor, I want to acknowledge that there are many um, uh, comments, not questions, in the, in, in the uh, in the chat, um, uh, praising your leadership, thanking you particularly for your leadership in the innovation and life sciences industry, uh, your leadership in that moment. So I did want to acknowledge um, those comments. Um, and uh, several uh, questions in there that I think um, reflect what's on a lot of people's minds. Uh, you have two people that have announced uh, that they're running uh, for mayor, um, at least in part. 
uh, they've suggested that it's time for change. So let me put it out there. Is it time for change or, or is there something you want to tell us today? I think quite honestly right now um, in September of 2020, it's time to focus on what's in front of us. It's time to make sure we continue to keep Bostonians safe. It's time to continue to make sure that we reopen our city safely. It's time to make sure that we reopen our schools it's safely. It's time to make sure that our tourism industry and our hotels and, and restaurants don't go bankrupt. Uh, it's time to, to stay focused on systemic racism and the, what we can do. And it's time, that, you know, we have an election coming up in, in, in about five weeks here. I think it's five weeks from today. Uh, that's going to chart either a new course for our country, uh, a, a course that's desperately needed in our country, or continue the same um, policies that have been in place the last three years. And we've seen where that's taken this country. So um, my focus right now is on making sure that, that we continue to, to move Boston forward. Um, and I think that quite honestly, that's what everyone's, all of our focus should be at this point. There'll be plenty of conversation and plenty of time to have um, you know, debates and all that other stuff after, after ne early next year, into next year. Um, but right now, I think it's important for us to stay focused on the job in front of us. I think uh, I'm not a person that likes to look down the road too much uh, because right now, um, I don't know of any other time in the history of Boston or of Massachusetts or our country that we've been faced with so many um, big, uh, complicated issues, dilemmas in front of us. And, and um, what Boston and what this country needs, I think is, is strong, steady leadership uh, and, and to move us forward. And when I say that, I'm not necessarily talking just about me. I think collectively, all of us, we need to continue to move forward and move our city forward. Mayor, hey, you mentioned um, uh, the election, presidential election coming up and um, you know we all know of your very strong and long relationship with um, Vice President Biden and another rumor about you of course is that you may jump down to Washington on us but I won't ask you that but I will ask you because you know so much of what we're faced with um, depends on strong action by the federal government um, you know should should Vice President Biden be elected um, how, how much might Boston benefit from that, um, or cities around the country for that matter? I think cities around America will be in a better position with, uh, with a, a President Biden. Um, when, when, when I first got elected mayor in 2014, uh, President Obama uh, had mayors from around America, big, small, big town, big cities, small cities, uh, often at the White House talking with his team about policies that affect America. And, and at that point, I would, I would could call a secretary directly to, to get a benefit. For example, uh, Whittier Street Housing Development um, here in Boston. Uh, it was one of the last programs that President Obama funded, $30 million. And you know, we were able to call the, 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 the Secretary of HUD, um, Castro, and, and talk to him about, about the importance of this and have that conversation. I, I think that you know that collaboration, rather than criti criticism of mayors and governors, or whether they're Democrats or Republicans, that's coming out of Washington right now. Uh, and, and I think that I think that having that relationship is important. I think day one, uh, having having a partner in the White House that understands the importance of advancing cities and not pulling them back, not 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 pitting Democrats versus Republicans, is important. Uh, just to address your first point, and I know you didn't want to bring it up, but in 2016, I saw a lot of people excited about the potential of going into the White House that for Hillary Clinton, and that didn't happen. And I would suggest to anyone that wants to work in Washington or get a job in Washington, you can't get there unless Joe Biden wins. And, and it's really important for, and I, I know, I'm not to get political, I don't, want, I don't mean to, because I know there's both on this call. So anyway, my point is, it's too early to be measuring curtains down in Washington. Um, but, but I do think that having a President Biden uh, is very important. And quite honestly, uh, Vice President Harris as well, um, who comes from San Francisco, understands the importance of local government. Um, she was a district attorney in, in San Francisco, um, you know, a, a attorney general and now a United States Senator. Having that person that understands local government and the impacts of local, local government goes a long way as well. Well, um, Mayor Walsh, thank you for joining us today and for an interesting and frank conversation uh, about all that we're dealing with here in the city of Boston. Before we close, I want to highlight a couple of upcoming programs that may be of interest to our, our audience. Tomorrow at 2 p.m., uh, we have a special free event in partnership with Project Beacon, the Broad Institute, focused on what strategies organizations can implement 
in order to safely bring back their employees and the importance of on-site and uh, fast testing. Uh, on Thursday, October 22nd, join us at 2 p.m. for our next Government Affairs Forum featuring U.S. Um, Congress Representative Catherine Clark for her first formal address to the Chamber of Commerce. You can register for these programs and find out more about uh, all activities of the Chamber by visiting bostonchamber.com. Once again, Mayor Walsh, thank you for joining us today. And thank you to the audience for uh, joining us as well. And have a great rest of the week.